So, you know what upsets me? How everyone seems so shocked that Cody Gakpo has been outperforming virtually every other player at the Euros. As if a year and a half ago, he wasn't beating Erling Haaland to become the player with the most goal contributions in Europe. No one should be shocked that he's doing well now, they should be questioning why he's been so underwhelming for Liverpool. They keep calling him a flop, making memes about him, some even racially abusing him. Even Jamie Carragher, a supposed Liverpool legend, has taken shots at him on social media when, if anyone one just took 5 seconds to look up anything about his past, they'd quickly realize that he has been completely yanked out of position ever since he moved to Liverpool. But we'll get there. The first thing I want you to understand is that Gakpo is not the kind of player that just flops. This isn't just a random kid who just happened to be so talented that he damn near stumbled into the spotlight. No. Gakpo's father was a football player back in Togo, even his mom was a rugby international for the Dutch national team, but as much as genetics can go a long way, according to everyone who's met his parents, the way they raised him was a true difference maker. As ex-PSV player and Gakpo's former coach Tvan Schippers explained, his parents are the foundation of everything. They are a very religious family. The only thing that ever mattered to him was playing this game. PSV was there from the moment he was born. In fact, as he explained it himself, I used to sleep under a PSV duvet with PSV posters all over the walls. Sure, I had Maradona, Pele and all the greats, but among them were always my local heroes, Afelai and Philippe Cocu. The kid was so obsessed by the club, he had his own seat right in the Z section among all the ultras, just so he could see the players up close when they came in and out of the tunnel. Still, it was only after three years at the smaller FC Eindhoven that he ended up joining their academy and, well, things were going great until he turned 15. You see, Gakpo used to be this short, really quick and skillful winger until one summer, just as he got injured and was unable to practice for months, he hit a shocking growth spurt and out of nowhere he was 6 foot 4, which may sound great but really isn't. As Gakpo said, suddenly my balance, my ability to turn, even my ball control had just become different. I actually had to learn to play football all over again. It was all so tough that there were a lot of people in the club who doubted he'd ever get past it. Even Gakpo himself felt that the dream was over, that his body had betrayed him. But that's until Thierry Henry came up on the TV. To see another guy almost as tall as him, destroying everyone on the left wing was proof that it was still very much possible and so Gakpo began studying him. Only two years later, not only was he already joining the under-19s, getting coached by none other than Ruud van Nistelrooy, but with a big man taking time of his day to teach him how to become a better finisher, suddenly Gakpo was back to being one of the biggest talents at the club, already splitting his time between the academy and the B team and still, somehow, managing to excel for both. It was 7 goals and 5 assists in 13 matches for one, 7 goals and 2 assists in 12 matches for the other, it was becoming obvious to everyone that Gakpo could perform anywhere if given the chance and so, 11 years after joining the club, the PSV Starboy finally got his first team debut coming in with 1 minute left against Feyenoord and the man who brought him in was none other than Philippe Cocu, one of the posters on his wall. Not to mention that, that one minute was enough to make him a league champion. By November, with the next season well underway and with Gakpo having already been called up for a few cup games, I guess he figured out all he needed was one final push because that month he went and secured two wins for the Dutch under-20s with a hat-trick in a 3-1 win and then a decisive goal as they beat Italy 3-2, then came back, joined the B team once more and scored another hat-trick against league leaders Go Ahead Eagles, eventually totaling 9 goals and 4 assists in 8 matches for the reserves by the time new coach Van Bobbel caved in and gave him his Eredivisie debut, playing a single minute against AZ Alkmaar before coming in at halftime for the very next match and immediately securing a goal and an assist. In fact, by the end of the season he had secured 4 more assists already, averaging 1 every 78 minutes, almost 3 times more than the league's top provider, Hakim Ziyech. As you may imagine, the following season it wasn't even up for discussion whether he joined the first team for good or not, and with his childhood idol Ibrahim Afelai coming back to the club, there could be no better motivation for him to bring his A-game to the table and so, Gakpo completed his first full league season for the club with a perfectly balanced 7 goals and 7 assists in just little over 1400 minutes, and yet he still felt like he could go much, much further. And the next year, he set everyone's expectations even 
even higher, opening the league season with two goals against Groningen, pretty much ruining Arjen Robben's comeback, before scoring three goals into playoff matches to seal PSV's place at Europa League, eventually also playing a huge role in getting them to the knockout stage, already totaling nine goals by early January, which was precisely when he severely injured his ankle, being sidelined for two months, only to come back and get infected with Covid, pretty much missing all that was left of the season. At this point, it would be easy to feel like Akpo's progress was stalling, especially with his 22nd birthday already catching up to him, but the reality is that, even though so far Gakpo had been unable to play a proper full season, even though his numbers weren't exactly mind-blowing, those who had watched him play were already convinced he was the next big thing. Not only did the national team manager Frank de Bauer make him the first Dutch player in 41 years to debut straight at the Euros, but with Malen leaving for Dortmund and Dumfries leaving for Inter Milan, PSV did not think twice before making Gakpo their new star player. And though, by October, his ankle injury striked again, precisely when he was on a run of 13 goal contributions in 13 matches, this time he made it back after only a month and put everything he had into trying to get PSV to the top of the table. And though, unfortunately, in the end, his 24 contributions in 22 starts were only enough for a second place finish two points short of Ten Hag's Ajax, he still managed to get his revenge, scoring precisely as PSV came back from behind to secure the cup title against that very same Ajax, meaning that no matter what happened once the season was over, Gakpo was the Dutch player of the year, and even if suddenly a lot of clubs were gunning for his signing, there was one man who seemed more invested than anyone else, and that was obviously Eric Ten Hag, who had now taken control of Man United. Regardless, whether it was due to everyone being in his ear, advising him against it, telling him that at United it'd be just another number, or because as Gakpo explained it, the deal just did not go through, he ended up staying at PSV, and thank god he did. The next season, with Ruud van Nistelrooy taking over the first team and Luke the Young going out injured, Gakpo was handed the captain's armband and took everything to a new level that genuinely not many of the VZ players had ever reached. First game of the season, Super Cup vs Ajax, Gakpo assists both goals as they come back from behind, then Ajax ties the game back up and he scores to put them in front again. Once the league starts, he gets a brace in the first game, an assist in the second, a goal and two assists in the third, and suddenly there were offers from Leeds United and Southampton on the table. The pressure was building up and with a chance to join a smaller team willing to make him a star, whichever arguments had convinced him to stay no longer made as much sense, Gakpo felt lost and able to make a decision and so, with one match left to play on deadline day, in his own words, I put it all in God's hands. I made a promise that if I scored once in that game, I'd move to Southampton, if I scored twice, I'd move to Leeds, and if I scored three, I'd remain at PSV. Only problem, Gakpo had never scored a hat-trick in the Eredivisie. Regardless, 25 minutes into the match, with the Leeds United sporting director watching from the stands, a penalty gave him his first goal, 14 minutes later he got another, and right as the second half got going, he took a shot, it deflected off a defender, and went in. And so, not knowing whether or not that goal belonged to him, Gakpo subbed off, sat on the bench, and his teammate Jordan Teze told him, it really is in God's hands now, he'll decide whether it is an own goal or not. In the end, the goal was given. Gakpo had scored his first ever hat-trick and as he said, I could not have gotten a clearer sign. And all I have to say is the things a man want to to stay far from Leeds United. <laughs> no matter what, this meant Gakpo now had all the time in the world to destroy every record in sight, so he got going again. Two goals in the next three matches and then an all-timer performance against Feyenoord. Once again, the moment his rivals went in front, he put in the most perfect weighted corner to tie the match and then scored with an incredibly composed strike, only for them to pull one back, tying the match, forcing him to get another assist and then watching them come from behind one final time and completing a hat-trick of assists to seal the result at a 4-3 win with none other than Arne Slot watching from the opposition's bench. Had three goals and eight more assists over the next nine matches and suddenly only four 
14 matches into the league season, Gakpo was on 21 goal contributions. For comparison, his mentor Vanisil Roy picked at 39 for a full season, the very best I remember seeing in the Divisi, the legendary Luis Suarez picked at 52, which is just ungodly, and yet, if Gakpo had kept going at that rate, he'd have matched his record. Furthermore, in a season where Haaland seemed to be slowly establishing himself as the next Ballon d'Or winner, the deadliest player on the planet, Gakpo was the only one in Europe to outdo him. The difference, though, was that Haaland let his own league in big chances missed, while Gakpo was greatly outperforming his expected goals, seemingly conjuring up goals out of thin air, while still ranking third in Europe for expected assists per 90, only behind Dembele and Thomas Muller. Name any creative or goal-scoring metric and he was either leading or in the podium across every single player in the league. God knows what would have happened had he finished off the season at PSV, but fortunately, or not so much so, he was called up for the World Cup in Qatar, which forced every league into a month-long break right in the middle of the season, and once there, well, if the world wasn't paying attention before, they surely were now. Gakpo became the first ever Dutch player to score in every group stage game. Matter of fact, only three had ever scored in three consecutive World Cup games, and their names were Johan Niskens, Dennis Bergkamp, and Wesley Schneider. Meaning that, with Ronaldo rampantly leaving Man United and Ten Hag still keen on his signing, the deal got moving again. Van Gaal and Coleman advised him to stay, Van Nistelrooy said the same, even Marco Van Basten came out of the woodwork trying to change his mind, and I guess in a way, it worked. Because Gakpo clearly didn't end up at United, instead, Liverpool, which just lost both Diogo Jota and Luis Diaz to injury, jumped at their chance and snatched him away from Ten Hag. However, if this could seem like a much better move than joining United, well, Klopp opened up his speech about his signing by claiming that there were easier moments to join Liverpool. But what I like about him is that he isn't the kind of guy who wants to jump on a moving train, he's the one who wants to push it forward. But the reality is that pushing that train would be much harder than he thought. With many already labeling the signing as nothing more than an impulsive reaction to the same old World Cup hype, Gakpo should have known that his club record fee of 42 million million euros wouldn't be enough to earn him the respect of the Premier League fans, but no matter what, upon arrival they threw him right into the starting 11, forcing him to play as a centre forward and immediately going on 6 games without scoring or assisting, only winning once, and already sort of getting in his own head. After this, a more positive stretch saw him score 4 goals in 5 Premier League matches, easing himself up to the fans by scoring a goal against rivals Everton and, more importantly, a brace against Man United in a legendary 7-0 thrashing that had even Andy Robertson raving about him to the press, claiming it was Cody's best game for Liverpool. It's been a short career so far, but his confidence was outstanding. Still, this was nowhere near the end of his struggles. As much as Gakpo himself insisted that he saw every difficulty as a possibility, as much as he stayed away from social media, barely ever posting since joining the club, no matter how much he held onto his fate as a sort of strength and resilience, by the end of the season, he had been relatively underwhelming, Liverpool had finished just outside the top four, missing out on Champions League qualification, and then Firmino left for Saudi Arabia, meaning that even though it was clear that he was getting sick and tired of being played in the center, that wasn't coming to an end anytime soon. Though, to be fair, he surely got to try out other positions. You see, it wasn't all about Firmino. Anderson and Fabinho left as well and Klopp was pretty much left without a defensive midfielder, which forced him to bring McAllister into that position, leaving him without a number 8, to which he had the brilliant idea of, at times, pulling Gakpo even deeper into that position, pretty much destroying any chance we'd ever get to see the old Gakpo at Anfield. I mean, hear me out. This past season, Gakpo played 7 matches in midfield, 27 as some kind of center forward, and only 12 as a left winger. Despite the fact that, if you compare his end product across all those roles, he still managed to contribute to 24% more goals when playing on the wing than on the center, even though he was quite literally further away from goal. If that isn't enough to convince you that this is his natural role, I don't know what will. Except I actually do, because at the Euros, Ronald Koeman moved him back to the left wing for good and, well, in the opening match, he scored the goal that started their comeback and took the man of the match. Then, after a goalless draw to France, he came back, scored against Austria and then put down his best performance of the tournament in the round of 16 against Romania, scoring, assisting, putting players through with backheel passes, almost getting another goal if not for VAR. This guy was bullying Draguzin and yet, he still went on to pretty much score their winner against 
Jason Sturk in the quarterfinals going out of the tournament as its top scorer. In fact, I'll tell you something more. Aside from Mbappe, no player has outscored Cody Gakpo across the two previous major international tournaments. As Van der Vaart put it, there are not many players who could receive the ball and make a defender his pants, but Gakpo is one of them. And with Jurgen Klopp leaving and being replaced precisely with Dutch manager Arne Slot, who is very well aware of how good Gakpo can be, this revolution might be the perfect time for him to take over.